Okay, welcome back to the second part on multicollinearity, where we just got done calculating the standard error for a multiple regression by hand, and the standard error for highway miles per gallon in this regression. Let me show you the regression, just to remind you what we were doing. We were explaining the price of cars uh, with a data set that is already built into R. And so if you haven't watched the first part of this video called Part A, then I suggest you, you start there. But we were looking at this, um, not that regression, sorry, this regression, uh, with, where we're explaining price with miles per gallon highway, miles per gallon city, engine size, horsepower, etc., to see which of these variables are related to price. And we saw that miles per gallon highway and city Neither of them are statistically significant because the p-values are quite high. And we were looking at, well, why, is the, why are the standard errors what they are? So we calculated those by looking at the sum of squared residuals, basically the variance of the uh, variable we're looking at, 1 minus the r-squared, where this is the r-squared of the regression where you're explaining miles per gallon highway with the other explanatory variables and so we used this r squared 0.905 in that part and square root of the degrees of freedom and so we said that for multicollinearity we want to focus on this term the 1 minus r squared because it's all about multicollinear uh, multicollinearity is all about how related each explanatory variable is to the other explanatory variables. And if we zero in on this term in the denominator of the standard error formula, we said that if that r squared is zero, then basically this term goes away. It becomes the square root of one and doesn't really affect the standard error. But as that r squared gets to be larger and larger, say 0.99, what we get in the denominator is 1 minus 0.99, which is 0.01. And then the square root of that is going to still be a very small number below 1. And in the denominator of this fraction, it's going to increase the standard error quite a bit. Now, we can see this a little bit better if we rewrite the standard error formula, bringing out that term over here by itself. 1 over the square root of 1 minus that r squared. Now, let's look at that r squared that we got, 0.905. Many times you'll see people calculate something called a VIF, a variance inflation factor. And the variance inflation factor is simply, I need to fix this formula here. Well, it's not going to let me fix it. So, let me just rewrite it here. It's 1 over 1 minus... Uh, the r squared that we're talking about. I'll just call that r2. And so the r squared we're looking at here is 0.905. And so 1, min one over 1 minus that is going to be um, 1 over 0.95, right? Or 0.095, right? And so if we actually get the Excel to calculate for that for us, equals 1 over. 0.095 gives us the variance inflation factor here. And so the variance inflation factor of 10.52 doesn't really mean anything. That's why I don't like variance inflation factors. Many books and many teachers of econometrics will tell you a variance inflation factor is bad if it's bigger than 5. But then it ends there. So I'm going to take it one step further and tell you what this variance inflation factor actually means. In order to do that, rather than calculating a variance inflation factor and getting 10, I'd rather calculate what I call an SEIF, a standard error inflation factor, which is instead of 1 over 1 minus r squared, it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus r squared. And that's this part of the formula stuck over on the side here for the standard error. Now when you calculate that, you can see pretty clearly what it's going to do to the standard error. Now let's calculate it and see what number we get here. Now you can do this the long way, or you can just take the square root. I hope you see, you know, if you take the square root of 1 over 1 minus r squared, that's the same as the square root of 1 
divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. So you could just take the square root of what we got here. So let me do that. Uh, SEIF is equal to uh, the square root of this 10.52. And so we get 3.244. That standard error inflation factor, if we bring it up here, and we look at what it's going to do here, 3.2. 443, that number gets multiplied by the other determinants of the standard error over here. And so given your sum of squared residuals, the variance of the variable you're looking at, and the degrees of freedom, this thing over here is 3.244. And so what that means to me is because the uh, r squared between this variable, miles per gallon highway, and the other variables is high, 0.905, meaning 90% of the variation in highway miles per gallon is explained by the other variables. So most of this variable we're looking at is redundant to the other information contained in the other variables. And because of that high relationship, that high multicollinearity, the standard error for that variable, highway miles per gallon, is going to be higher by a factor of 3.2443. And that's why we call it a standard error inflation factor, or I call it a standard error inflation factor. Most people call it a variance inf inflation factor, and they don't take the square root. I like to take the square root because it tells me what's going to happen to the standard error, not what's going to happen to the square of the standard error, or you could call it the uh, you know standard variance or the variance of the error or something like that. That 3.2443 really means something. Now what does this really mean to us in the real world? Well what it means is if we look at the regression results that we did in R here, and we look at that um, standard error of 0.35508 and we look at that t stat of minus 1.18 it's telling us that if it wasn't for the fact that miles per gallon highway was so highly related to these other explanatory variables then that standard error could be much much lower maybe a third as large as it is now what would happen if nothing else changed. Now I'm not saying nothing else would change, but if nothing else changed and that standard error was a lot smaller, like 0.1, then that estimate of 0.4 divided by 0.1 would give us a very large t-statistic. And so if we could somehow get rid of the multicollinearity, get rid of the fact that this miles per gallon highway is so highly related to the other variables, maybe it could solve the problem, if we think it's a problem, that this p-value is so high and the variable is not statistically significant. So what can we do about this? Well, we can look at the correlation between pairs of variables. Now, first let's just use our brains and say, now wait a minute, I bet for most cars, the miles per gallon it gets on the highway is very highly related to the miles per gallon it gets in the city. Let's verify that. Um, MPG highway, comma, MPG city and let's see what that correlation just between those two variables is and look it's 0.94 maybe that's where this high r squared came from in our standard error formula so how about we run that regression again that we ran before but let's leave out this miles per gallon in the city variable and let's just see what happens and do a summary of car reg and see what happens there. Now look, our miles per gallon highway variable, it still has a negative slope. That standard error is much lower now than it was. And that t stat is much larger in absolute value. And look, that uh, p value is much smaller now. Now there are no guarantees when you do things like this because all these variables are influencing each other. But in a case like this, you can pretty clearly see which variable is causing the multicollinearity. And if you can drop that variable without any adverse effects, keep in mind omitted variables bias.
then you can lower the standard errors of a variable that might be a key variable to you that you're really interested in seeing. So I hope this helped you understand variance inflation factors and that if you take the square root of a variance inflation factor it tells you something really interesting. It tells you how much larger your standard error is because the variable you're looking at is highly related to the other values. Now let me, let me show you one other trick in R before we leave. There's a library that you need to install that does not come standard with R. You can go to Packages, uh, Install Package, and then it will ask you to select a country that's near you, and then you would select this library named CAR. I'm not going to go through and do that, but once you do that and you load that library car, so I've done that here, you can run a variance inflation factors on a regression that you ran. And the command is just VIF, and here you can see that variance inflation factor that we talked about.